Everybody, welcome to another installment of Show to V with Mike G, the show of a light, the show of analog recording, Queen Bacardi, Lincoln Henderson, and so much more with today's guest, Mr. Wesley Henderson, the co-creator of Angels Envy Bourbon and their current chief innovation officer. We talk about a lot of different things, the businessman at heart, but creative and driven, ambitious, a true-blooded entrepreneur, a pilot. So many great little nuggets about Wes here in this chat. And I had known a little bit about him going into it and to get to experience his life, his success, and talk about this recent transition into the Cardi team. It was really, really a pleasure. So without further ado, I hope you guys enjoy this great chat with Wes Henderson, co-creator and chief innovation officer of Angels Envy. All my editing was done basically with a uh, uh, razor blade. Yeah. On, okay. on uh, you know, on reel to reel tape. Real, real. So, um, you know, we didn't do any multi tracking stuff or anything like that. But I was always amazed, you know, when I went to real studio. And, and, you know, really, I'd tell you who was really good at that, I thought, um, was Queen. Oh, my gosh. And the yes. way that Brian May could layer stuff like that. So, can we talk about Queen for a second? I yeah, sure. Queen, is, that's kind of where I started, like music, right? Right. I love Queen and the, to your point, like their use of tape, right? So this is the thing I didn't know about tape. So take Bohemian Rhapsody, right? Which the story goes, they taped over it so much that had he done any more takes for Brian May, he would have ruined the tape and Bohemian Rhapsody would have been lost forever. But did you know that to get that, that really lush vocal harmony technique, they all sang all of the parts? That I didn't know. Isn't that crazy? But how do you sing? I don't understand how you... First of all, you know Freddie Mercury with like a like a three octave range or whatever. I mean, how how do these guys? And then you think of John Deacon, who you know you can you know or you know one of those guys. You know how do they? It just today it, it's so it's so. My kids were listening to it the other day. Yeah. And I was trying to explain to my son when he was listening to the sounds, all the sounds in the song. I'm like, guys, that's Brian May. That's yeah, that's that's insane. all his. That's yeah. his guitar. That's his his boxes. His distortion. All the electronics that he created. And it was way before its time. Well, he built that guitar. The it was a motorcycle kickstand. That's Amazing. the whammy bar. A crazy thing. Yeah. yeah. So it's one of those things where, gosh, you know, if we think about bourbon, right? Now, I'll kind of shift this around and stuff. Mm-hmm. But the analog nature of stuff. We're in an era right now where it's a little bit digital, a little bit impersonal, you know. And I think that bourbon is one of the last vestiges to having to connect with nature or process. But it's an analog spirit. Does that make sense? That makes makes a ton of sense. And. Yeah. And you see it, um, and hopefully it'll never change. I mean, there's, there's certainly always science. You, I call it creep, like mm-hmm. corporate creep or science creep or whatever. And, oh, sure. and it, there's always this uh, attempt from different directions to to creep in on the on history and the way you did things. Um, but you also see a return to, you know, we pop it back to music real quick, is it look at vinyls come back. Yeah. So, Which you know, is a, a brilliant thing <laughs> because you have to sit there in that room and you've got to touch it. Right, you have to really, really interact with it. I think that that's one of the reasons that spirits, just in general, or food, to I think even a lesser extent, it forces you to interact. That's not a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. That's at all. why we do it. You yeah. know, I, I talk about that a lot. I talk about um, not just in the production aspect of it, but you know, you also take spirits on to what our what really spirits were designed for, and that was to enhance our social experiences together and. And sit down and, and enjoy enjoy a drink with friends and family for special occasions and things yeah. like that. So I mean, it goes all the way down the line, and there's that history and that tradition. And so you know, it starts with production. It start well, it starts with the earth. It starts with the right. grains. It starts with the farmers and you know the terroir even. And then you bring that into to production, and then uh, the production process, which is analog. Yeah. And then the hopefully our experiences together as humans is is analog. But I hope so. You know, anymore not a virtual it's, it's one, right? Diff- you know, where it seems like we're headed that way. But, um, you know, thank God that it still is uh, very analog and that we can enjoy time with each other. And spirits enhance that experience. Yeah. Well, I think when you talk about the vinyl piece, that's indicative of us as, as people that want to connect. Nothing is 
rallies us together, facilitates conversation and thought more than just sitting around having a couple of drinks. For sure. You know, it's one of the greatest kind of lubricants still to yeah. this day. You know. But it's, it's exciting. So there is so much we, we could talk about. There's lots of different things. And I'm a people person. I think a lot of people say, oh, you've got like this master of bourbon that you're going to be talking to and things. But for me, to me, you're, if I understand correctly, firefighting, right? Mm-hmm. It's a piece of your life. Being a pilot is a piece of your life. Being a bourbon magnate, being a stereo radio guy. I mean, there's so many places that we can start, but let's start. Let's go back a little bit sure. farther, right? So you went to school in Florida, but were you raised in Kentucky? Grew up in Kentucky. Yeah. Um, spent most of my life in Kentucky. Uh, went to school in Florida yeah. and um, studied aeronautics at the Florida Institute of Technology, which is where I learned how to fly airplanes. And um, lived down there for a number of years and then came back to Kentucky to start Angels Envy. Oh, interesting. So when you talk about your bass player, so I'm trying to, how do we become who we are, right? That's always the interesting part of this journey. And so we, as a kid, were you, would you say you were kind of more into math stuff? Were you into science, history? What things really appealed to you? I think I was always a science geek because of my dad and because of his... Uh, leanings in life and his the things that he did always fascinated me so I always spent a lot of time with him I kind of rode in the I was an athlete too so I kind of rode I was able to I was really yeah. cool because I was able to play basketball and yeah. football so I was able to to kind of navigate through high school with a lot of different groups of people which right. was which was fun because you got a lot of different experiences and my parents definitely encouraged this probably the science side my dad was originally going to go to medical school what what uh, what fly, or what's uh, discipline right well, uh, hearts or I'm sorry, what was it? Like a disciplined brain, heart, lungs. Oh, I don't know what Dad really wanted to do. I mean, I, I know he he just wanted to go to med school. I don't know yeah. what interested him the most. He worked on an ambulance crew when he was in college, and that might have had early college. That might have had something to do with it. Oh, interesting. And um, <clears throat> um, so there was an influence there, and they always encouraged the science, and I gravitated to that. And I really don't think I had a career path, although I tell you what, I love the microphone. I love music. And I love that early, you know, I, I listened to, I'd sit in my bed at night and listen to AM radio and listen to, uh, WLS and Chicago and listen to all these AM stations. You can only pick up at night because of the atmosphere mm-hmm. and listen to all these, these fabulous disc jockeys from New York city, from Cincinnati, from St. Louis, from Chicago. And that's probably where, if I look back to an early age, I see that influence, you know, in, yeah. in, in music and entertainment and what eventually led to radio at Do a you young think age. That- was being a performer in that sense, was that ever part of the, the trajectory for you? Or did science really just take over? I think probably the performance aspect of it, although I never really looked at it performing. I looked yeah. at it as just I enjoyed being around people. I enjoyed being, I guess that really what it is. You are an entertainer. Yeah. I enjoyed being able to take a crowd of people and, and motivate them and, you know, get people fired up. And, um, you know, when I DJed and, 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 you know, that's really what it was. It was about the hype. It was a good sense of, you know, it, showing people a good time. And maybe that translates to what I do now. You know, it's, it's, it's not that different. Doing I mean, my you best know, to show people a good time. Absolutely. You're setting the tone. You are the DJ or the right. DJ in a, in a sense. I always said the DJ was, you know, the DJ was phenomenal because you, you ruled the room as a DJ. You could make it with your music. Yeah. You could say when people would dance, when people would dance fast, when they dance slow and they go to the bathroom whether or not they were going to get lucky that night, That's when they were going to right. get a drink. Love it. All I that, mean, yeah. you orchestrated, you literally orchestrated that room. You could, you could be make the guy move around. that helps someone meet the love of their life. You could. I mean, oh, that's, I that's, that's very powerful. <laughs> in, intensely powerful. So give me give me a few things. What, what were some of your favorite <clears throat> records, like when we're talking about when you're kind of maybe heading into college and things? I was really big into... Um, really what I call the alternative of that time, which would have been the 80s, which yeah. was um, U2, oh, yeah. early U2, REM. Because they're just around the corner, really, in Athens. Georgia, right, there you R- go. You know, Man, what, a, what a great group. So that, think of that movement and those bands that were really big. A little bit maybe on the fringe of punk, but yeah. not so much. I didn't really get too much into like the Black Flag and all that, a little some of that, what I considered the Sex Pistols. And right, right. That was a little too hard for me. But, Punch um, throwing music. Yeah, exactly right. But um, so that's... Though, the, and the, I was listening to some of that coming over here today. Oh, yeah. I had some R.E.M. on the radio. Oh, that's good. But I was also listening to um, Imagine Dragons doing a cover of uh, Taylor Swift. Uh, oh, uh, dude, so, yeah. you know, Blank Space. So, you know, it was an acoustic, stripped-down, like, acapella version of Blank Space. I just so. love that you're still connected to it. Because this is the thing. There are so many people in this industry that come from music, that come from art. 
they're still painting, they're still playing bass, they're still playing guitar. And I think that that's what, what kind of keeps us into the industry because of bourbon, right? It's, it really is a melody. It's a combination of bass tones, mid-tones, treble. And I don't know, that's the way it resonates with everybody. That's a really good point. I've never looked at it like that. And I, can't, I can't stop analyzing shit. Well, I mean, maybe I don't it's, know it's, well, it's, it, we're social animals. And, and, and I think that if you gravitate towards an industry where a social, the social aspect is so prevalent, then you're likely, those things are likely to transcend into other parts of your life. Yeah. You know, I, I've always say, you know, I'm kind of one of those jack of all trades, but king of none, yeah, you know, yeah. um, I collect experiences is what I really like to, to say. And, I look at flying. I looked at, I don't know if firefighting is really a collected experience because that's become a real part of my life. Um, but just little things along the way so I can check that box off. Yeah. I did that. I accomplished that. You know, I got that license. I got that experience. I got that certification. I got to be able to do that. And now I can move on to something else. And that kind of, I think it, it's not like the whole Renaissance man thing because I think that's kind of a douchey thing to say. But, <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's a collector of experiences. That's the only other way I can describe it. But I like that. That's a really brilliant thing. Is there any, thinking of this list, I can't imagine the kinds of things that have checked off on your list, but is there anything that's just slightly out of reach for you that you keep, keep, keep trying to accomplish, but it's just just short? I think you me. always want things that are just beyond your reach. I think so, too. And I don't really know what, they are because you know the list changes a lot you know as you get older as you as your priorities in life change and things shift around so something that might have been important to you for whatever reason for ego for experience whatever may 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 be different tomorrow somebody asked me a question in an interview not too long ago and they said well, what's one thing you'd like to do and i said well, i want a sag card yeah that's I'd, amazing you should do I'd, it i i i don't know how the hell i'm going to get a sad card i'll put you in a movie put me in a movie i need yeah, a speaking sure. part in a movie Did you want a speaking part okay well i think to get i think you have to i don't know maybe not i heard you had to have a speaking part to get think, a sad card i think you're right we, you can say these pretzels are making me thirsty that's it <laughs> and boom boom sad card. done sad check card. that box move on to the next i thing. really want to help you get the sad well, card let's do Must, that i think that's absolutely within reach you know how great the film scene is here in austin i understand that yeah so maybe maybe you never know and then you can help me fly a plane maybe yeah it takes a while that it? yeah it's it's uh it's very liberating though it's very exciting it's very technical you know you almost have to live it yeah you know to keep from killing yourself or killing somebody <laughs> else um yeah, there's a little bit of responsibility yeah you just can't it. pull it off the side of the road you know like you can a car right Say, oh, I want to rest for a while, or you know, I'm I'm too str- I'm too stressed. I'm going to sit here for a minute. But all right, what? so we have a deal. Yeah, good. All right, I like this mutual exchange, Definitely. sipping some bourbon, SAG card, mm-hmm. pilot. Got it. perfect. How long does it take when you were at the aeronautics school? How long does it take to actually become a certified, if if that's the right word, pilot? It depends on how far you want to go. Yeah. Um, my son Spencer, for example, who started. Uh, his flight lessons at 16, oh, wow. you know, I mean, you can get your pilot certification if you do it the right way in a couple of years. That's it. Okay. Now that's just basic piloting. You know right. I mean? You can go on and get instrument ratings. You can get ratings in turbines. You can get ratings in seaplanes. You can get a, what they call lighter than air rating. You can, okay. it's a blimp. Oh, got it. Okay. Don't have that. That's, that could be something. To, that's helicopter's a good one, right? another one. Yeah. Helicopter is fun. Okay. That might be a good one. All right. Is that a little bit, a little bit shorter? <laughs> Time to get to proficiency there? Well, I mean, it's just another thing. It's, it's going beyond the basic piloting. Got it. So you start off as a private pilot, and then you go up from there maybe to an instrument pilot and so on, and then maybe to commercial pilot, and then you get a helicopter rating, let's say. All right. That makes sense. So then you can fly helicopters. just adds another element of danger to your life, which my wife hates. So you've so. got booze flying. These are really already. They don't work that, well together. <laughs> it's a, it they just don't seem to mix. Firefighting and, you know, they just don't. They, they, <laughs> they frown on that type of thing. What, what if maybe... The firefighting piece is just a solution for the other two combined. You basically go. crash something yeah. because you've been drinking. Now, I'm not as, as making any sense. I, I know. I understand. But then, I understand. But then you, can, you can clean up your own mess. That's you know, pretty good. Yeah. Fortunately, I have other people that help. I make so many messes, I have to have other people to help me clean them up. Uh, <laughs> you've got a squad. Thank God for that. <laughs> thank. I mean, without my support, I'd be really screwed. Um, but you know, I think that's, that's good. I think the firefighting thing kind of wraps it all up and you know, that's also given me an awareness. I've always been aware growing up about responsibilities with, with social responsibilities with alcohol yeah. and, and moderation. And my dad really instilled that in me early, but, um, doing that job and seeing the results of irresponsible behavior, not just with alcohol, but right. irresponsible behavior in general 
really gives you a um, drives you to make sure that you be as socially responsible as you can and put out that message as often as you can. All right. Well, it's interesting because I'm trying to think. So you you finish, you get your certification, your degree. Mm-hmm. You're flying. Were you doing commercial piloting no. or p- no, private just for pilot? fun? Yeah, just for fun. Just for fun. What was? Gosh, and I hate to sound like a dad, but what was your day job when when you got out of school? I was working in radio for a long time. Yeah. Um, I ended up uh, working at Brown Foreman where my father worked. Really? Uh, in what capacity? Uh, I started off, and believe it or not, I started off like a lot of people did. I started off in the mailroom. That was oh, my no first kidding. job at Brown Foreman. And I learned more in the mailroom at that company than any place I ever worked there. No kidding. Because you were in the belly of the beast. Right. I would drive the CEO at the time. You know, I was like his good FaceTime, his right? driver, yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, I'd take him to the airport. I'd take him different places. I'd pick him up. It was snowing outside and a lot of the other executives. So I was a fly on the wall for a lot of very interesting discussions. That's incredible. And just, you know, and Brown Forum was always really good about that. They started a lot of uh, legacy family members and they, that's where they started. They all yeah. started in the mailroom, probably for that reason. So you're cut out to be an actor. You see, this is not a very different trajectory for those that <laughs> <laughs> slumming it in L.A., yeah, look, Start I'll, in the mail room. I'll do whatever I can do. Okay, I like. All right, this is yeah. good. We're building a good foundation. I'll, I'll do whatever I can. I have to do. And um, did that ever? Did it ever transition? So, I imagine <clears throat> your vast interest and intellect took you into a lot of different fields. But did you ever bartend? Like actually behind the bar doing prep stuff. Like I'm that? not good behind a bar. No. I didn't. I, I worked as a server in school, mm-hmm. so I have that. You know, which I think helps in this business because I see that aspect. Oh yeah. But I'm almost dangerous behind the bar, and probably <laughs> shamefully so. I should probably spend more time behind the bar. You yeah. know, I'm not. A, I don't have a very good library of cocktails. I mean, I know the cocktails, but if you want to sit here and say, Wes, you know, make twenty of these cocktails, right. you know, I'm probably gonna be like, duh. I've got an app for that, though. <laughs> That's good. See, it, it's all about hiding it. Exactly it's right. So excuse me, just a minute. Let me step out, <laughs> and then I'll come back and know how to make the cocktail. I like that. I like yeah. that. But. Th- I think even even some experience in hospitality in that sense and just being humble and getting to know people and things, I think that's a really great piece to have. Look, we're partners in this business. Yeah. Um, we are in the hospitality business. As a distilled spirits producer, our livelihood depends on the livelihoods of the people that, that serve our spirits. Mm-hmm. And their recommendations can make a lot of difference to consumers. So I think that's one thing we've done a really good job with this brand was is that we have gotten very close, and it's not been – it's been a very organic. Yeah. It hasn't been forced. But Good we've, people. We've, we've gotten really close to the bartender mixology, the hospitality industry, mm-hmm. and really embraced as, as family members. You know, we're in this thing together, and that pays off. You know, even though that's not what we set out. You know, it wasn't a calculated thing. You know, I think we've just become a fabric of that community now. I think so, too. And it, it helps. It really does. We help each other. Well, if you guys have anything about the Angels, which we'll get to that chapter here shortly, but if there's anything else stripped from that brand, the people affiliated with your brand and Angels Envy and that narrative, it's brilliant. You guys have a great credibility, a lot of integrity and mm-hmm. things, and I guess that speaks really highly to you and kind of the culture I think you wanted to percolate right uh, it's definitely what we shot for and and you know you, you have to set that tone but it's up to everybody else to carry that on so yeah. we we have the right people that have the right attitudes that have the integrity that and the excitement and the um the drive to make something that's good even better yeah and you know we just we set back and and let them do what they're what they're best at and you're right we have a, there's no doubt we have some of the best collection of people i've ever seen in one business yeah and that a team for sure that's what takes you places you know it's so it's, it's what sets you a part it's not it's not what makes you a good company that's what makes you a great company yeah well so i'm wondering this it feels like innately you have this entrepreneurial spirit right now and a lust for life as well we call it there, it's add is what they call is it. is that right i think that's probably it there's <laughs> drugs for it and they don't work so they're not working for Brain me anyway. i like that yeah intellectual dysfunction well i don't know i don't know there's probably some of that too something like that but going from i mean i'm not gonna even say it's lowly but that <clears> starter <throat> position being a male guy, what is the first time where you thought, I want to start something of my own? I want to create something because I think I'm ready to do this. When I left Brown Foreman, um, worked my way up, um, I was downsized. Oh. And at that time, I really felt like I did not want to be in a corporate environment again because it was too, you know, you were in, in one stroke of a pen, you could be Just out gone, the door. Right, yeah. 
So then I got involved in other entrepreneurial ventures with, with friends uh, into a publishing business. Uh, what kind still of worked in radio. We Music did, uh, no, we did books. Oh, no kidding. <laughs> we did a couple. This is a, uh, some of my, my folks that work with me probably don't know this either. Is when um, we had a couple of books that, that, that I published. One of them was a, um, a desktop, like an organizer, okay. is what we called it. So it was a bound book with a plastic binding right, right. and they were envelopes that were bound like large envelopes okay so on the front of one envelope, it was called uh, the bottom drawer is what we called it so it's where you organized all your home warranties and everything like that so it was bound together in one book oh i see okay. so they had big envelopes so like one would say like kitchen appliances so you'd stuff all your kitchen right, appliance right, right. stuff and there was place to write on the front so you it's had like the, everything the accordion in one. kind of things it like wasn't that? an accordion it was it was like a spiral bound oh spiral bound okay, like a plastic okay. you know like a plastic comb Gosh, bound yeah yeah uh, and then we did another one called um, School Memories, and it was a school memory book. So it was first grade, second grade, you know, no so on and so forth. And it had, and we were a vendor. We were selling them in Walmart. We were a vendor in Walmart for those books. We, but we were so we spent most of the day in the bar, <laughs> and we were so stupid that we had no idea what we had. You know, we had a product in Walmart, right? Um, that was selling like crazy. We'd sit in the bar with our brick phones, our Motorola. Remember right, our Motorola yeah, yeah. brick phones. My business it's partner like, and I, we both have a phone, so right. we're both sitting there, probably calling each other instead of talking to each other. <laughs> so we go in the bar for, for lunch, and then before you knew it, it was happy hour. Before you knew it, it was transitioning to evening, you know. So we ended up spending the whole day there. But, uh, you know, we just we let that business fall apart because we weren't smart enough to realize what that's we had. Inc- that's incredible. What year are we talking, roughly? This goes back to probably 19, uh, let's see, uh, 91. No, 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 no. It goes back further than that. Nineteen. Trying to think of when my I go. I mark things by the ages of my kids. Ah, so that's good. I'd say yeah, probably nineteen ninety, nineteen ninety one. So you were there, and you could have yeah. kept doing it. I mean, do you ever <clears throat> to diversify in your latent life? Do you ever think about going back? I mean, you yeah. seem to have a series of good ideas, Wes. I mean, you know, they seem to be resonating um, pretty well. I'm working on partners in a. Uh, a, a, a a sauce right now like a hot sauce oh brilliant and that's just it's on the side it's something that um i'm working with a chef down in florida she's really an amazing story about uh, a young woman who was a firefighter a medic and, and a military and she uh, was diagnosed with ms mm-hmm. and she became a chef because she knew that her her the lifestyle she was doing that she could not do it anymore so i partnered with her and we've got a, a sauce that's getting ready to go national and that's fun i, I just look at opportunities like that that, that are to work with good people mm-hmm that are fun ideas and then you know kind of move on i have a short attention span once again <laughs> comes back to the whole i'm trying to think what's ADD the right thing. amount of time to talk to you before you start looking at the other stuff no the i've already been looking at the stills when i walked in here i was looking around uh, there's way too much eye candy in this, th- this there place, is man. they usually medicate me before i do these things oh, you that's know, good. my staff they have a, a dart gun that they usually i thought shoot so me i smelled some weird yeah, kind of like uh, yeah, tranquilizer yeah, type stuff going yeah, yeah. well th- so all right, this is the amazing thing. Again, really diverse. Lots of danger, I imagine. Perilous situations. My wife hates it. I, how did? Well, how long have you been married now? 20 some odd years. Do you think it's... Closer to 30 than 20. That's, that's crazy. But I mean, she's going to hate it no matter what. Like, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, I think. Well, you're more damned, though, if you're doing stuff that, <laughs> that you can you know possibly not walk away from right well this is true does she encourage you now as you guys you have six kids I mean, yes does she encourage you to do more piloting and stuff no that's a little more risk avert no because that's risky too yeah um you know i don't fly as much as i used to i would like to do more of that yeah. um when my home most of the time i spend is, is i'm on call you know and i'll make runs at the at the, at the station Got it. i enjoy that it keeps me you know believe it, it keeps me in shape a little yeah. bit. Oh, that's a good point too. It um, keeps me alert and aware, and, and uh, there's a sense of community. There's a sense of brotherhood with the people I work with. You know, yeah. we've got a really tight uh, crew, really tight station. Same guys I work with all the time. Guys that you trust your, you know, trust your life with. Have and, to, yeah. And uh, there's a there's a real sense of, of brotherhood there, which I enjoy. Um, but you know, I, I try to spend as much time I can with the kids when I'm home. Yeah. Well, it makes sense. Same thing with my dad. Like he's, yeah. he's traveling all the time now, and when we get good quality time, I mean, that's really what counts now. That's why you do it. You know, time is fleeting. And you know, I tell is. people we're, we're, we, we're dying the day we're born. And then when you start to see, you know, younger people, and, you know, this year has been one of those years where, you know, our, like our pop our idols of dropping off like flies. And oh, man. You start to get, you know, I turn 50, you start to get a sense of little sense of mortality, I think. And, um, you know, you just, 
live 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 your life with as much zest as you can. Did the Bowie thing affect you? No, no. I don't think so. You know, I was kind of, I was into Bowie. Um, I probably should have been more into him as much as I was into music. Yeah, it's because it, it seems like a contemporary or a guy that influenced. All I think it was a little bit before. I don't, well, not before. I mean, the whole Ziggy Stardust thing and all that stuff. I never really got into. I didn't really. Um, it just didn't resonate with me. Yeah. So um, I think more of the pop. You know, I mean, I, there's so many. Uh, Prince probably was a bigger thing to me because that was my college. Yeah. It was a soundtrack for my college. You know, my freshman year of college and stuff like That's that. Crazy. So you well, think George of, Michael too, maybe even, George right? Michael too. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that was that was late '80s. Um, so those things, you know, and, and uh, you know, you start to think, wow, they're gone. Well, it makes me feel older. No I kidding. Those songs, like, yeah, it's been 20 I'm years since that. that song. So you get to this point, you've got some failed good ideas, but that's all right. You get into <clears throat> Consulting, it sounds like, with mm-hmm. dist- whether it's distillation or mm-hmm. brand development and all of that. About how long were you doing that before you got this kind of <clears throat> idea for Angel's Envy? Probably about five or six years. Um, I worked with a brand called Conecca Ridge. or Cl- It's now Clyde Mays Whiskey. Oh, is it? Re- okay. Yeah, I yeah, know that brand. Um, it, that was an amazing story. And the way that brand started and some of the, the things behind that that happened were just would just blow you away. What you, uh, in terms of just exciting things, dangerous things, riveting? What? Exciting. You know, this brand was, it's a great story, and I don't hear it told very often, but we created this little brand down in Alabama, and the the guy that, that created it, Kenny May, his father was a, was a well-known moonshiner in, okay. in Alabama. Everybody knew Clyde May and knew yeah. his whiskey, and especially his Christmas whiskey. He would make Christmas whiskey, and they package it up and little things and take it around. But he went to federal prison for it. Wow. And um, so, so Kenny created this 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 brand, and I came on shortly thereafter. And we had a, an Alabama legislator that was on the board. So the Alabama legislature introduced a, a resolution, a non-binding resolution, mind. Okay. This is where it gets interesting, naming Conecuh Ridge the official state spirit of Alabama. Wow! So nobody ever had a commercial product name. You know, you get your official bird, you get your official tree, sure, or whatever. Not a booze. Special official booze. So the I think legis- I'm liking Alabama more now, actually. I thought You're going to like it even more when you hear the rest of the story. <laughs> so the legislature introduced a non-binding resolution. This isn't legislation. you know. Yeah. It's just a – well, the governor at the time, Rob Riley, a conservative Republican, did not like that. Okay. So the governor vetoed the non-binding resolution. Okay, okay. The legislature then came – and I remember there's things like education happening here – <laughs> roads, very vital People things are falling operating into a the sinkhole, government. But it's important we talk about this. Boost, so dude. the governor um, vetoed it. The legislature overrode the governor's veto to keep it the official state spirit of Alabama. That's to the, incredible. To this day, it still is. No. Sh- wow. And uh, they were talking about it on Saturday Night Live on the on the news. Saturday Night Live, the the you know the the weekend update. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They brought it up, and um, they uh, that was in the Wall Street Journal. They talked about it. So, um, but that brand kind of fell apart when Kitty May, the founder, got arrested for selling uh, to underage. Um, oh, no. it, really, it was truly he, the poor guy got set up. He, 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 God bless him, and he just passed away a few months ago. Good old boy from Alabama was trying to help somebody out by giving him a signed bottle, right? And didn't really realize what he was doing. Oh, no. Well, he might have realized what he was doing a little bit, <laughs> but the 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 Alabama uh, ABC had a thing for Kenny. Got it. Target and and probably a thing for his dad. I think so. Going back probably fifty years. Yeah. So, so Kenny got popped for that, and things got a little woolly. But I was like, "Hey, man, any press is good press." Sure. Um, but after that, things kind of got funny, and poor Kenny started running out of money, and it, you know the brand just it kind of died. But it's come back, and you know you see it on the show. It is. Now. I mean, Total Wine had a special bottle. You had a bottle that had a one ten, really nice whiskey. So good for them. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that they're doing well and. So, you know, there's a little bit of a connection to that that I feel pleased with. But, um, you know, it's all about, once again, moving on to the next thing. And, and that's about the time that Dad was thinking about retirement from Brown Foreman. Yeah. How long had he been with them, roughly, at that point? 38 years. Gosh. Yeah. And Brown Foreman kind of has this, um, like a lot of companies, you get to be a certain age, they kind of start pushing you out the door. And and that's really where Dad was. Yeah. And you know, even though displaced, he, maybe. Well, you know, even the, I mean, Dad had created Woodford Reserve. You know, he was their rock star master distiller. Yeah. I don't think they were smart enough to know at the time, and a lot of companies weren't smart enough to know at the time what the business was doing. You know, the bourbon was was exploding. Right, right. 
And Woodford was probably one of the first successful small batch products out there. Elmer Lee, you know, his he did a couple things, but mm-hmm. Blanton's uh, I think was kind of around the same time, right? about the same time. So, Dad was one of the first publicly visible master distillers. But I think if if Brown Form would have realized how important that was, Dad probably would have stayed there a little bit longer, which yeah. would have, which probably would have Angels Envy probably wouldn't have wouldn't happened. even happen, right? Yeah. So I'm thankful for that. So he'd been gone there for a couple of years when I decided I wanted to do this and. And, you know, went to him and kind of lured him out of retirement, not knowing that, you know, dad had no clue where we were going to go with this. I didn't either. Did he, had you always, or rather, had you had that chance to work creatively with your dad kind of side by side like that? If anything, I pushed it the other way. Ah. I did not want to be um, successful on my dad's coattails. Really, nobody, nobody cared who the master distiller was. Not then anyway, right? You know, they were all, you know, a bunch of bunch of science geeks that drank a lot you know and made made good booze still the same but now they're rock stars right you know (laughs) we have a lot of fun and so it just never really appealed to me and but as i got older you start realizing you you start thinking about things like legacy you start thinking about things like okay you know what can you do as a family going forward you you look at dad's history in the business you know i think dad was one of the most significant figures in the history of bourbon if you go back you know 150 200 years on one hand or both hands, I would say Dad would probably be counted as one of those figures wow. that is is would be remembered as as, as in that. So, can, so well, can we uh, can we use an analogy? We've been talking music. So, give, to give me a sense of the kind of guy that he is, and let's use is he like a Jimi Hendrix kind of guy, where everything was new and he's bold and innovative, or is he more like a Sir George Martin, where he's just so smart, everything that he does is perfect and so nuanced. Yeah, I think that I'd say more like a George Martin. Yeah. Um, you know, Dad was definitely innovative, um, but there were other people that had been there before him. Um, I think with Jimi Hendrix, I mean, he was just so he started in this yeah, unique thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so Dad just took the discipline and took it further, and you know, had certainly had creative ideas. Um, was an expert in maturation and wood, mm-hmm. and wood is probably the most important aspect of what we do here. You know, other people talk about water; they talk about this and that and the other. Right. The wood and the maturation and the the, the science behind the integrate you know the interaction with the wood is the most important part of making bourbon and dad was really an expert in that yeah and that didn't really it wasn't it wasn't really as important now you look at the what buffalo trace has done with all their experimental oh, yeah. collections and those are really phenomenal and dad did a lot of that stuff prior to that but what one thing that, that i think the buffalo trace did a really good job of is they from a scientific standpoint they went and did a really deep dive, and then they were they were gracious enough to release those results to yeah. the industry and to the world. But yeah, it's a really interesting thing to do. <clears throat> Very uh, selfless, right? For Help sure. Us all kind of understand yeah. and dismiss a lot of assumptions we have about how air works, how p- p- areas of the rick houses work, and things. That's not in tech. That does not happen. Besides no. Tesla, right? Tesla put all their battery technology out there, free mm-hmm. for all. But that doesn't really happen. So I think that's a kind of interesting testament to this industry it is and you see that cooperation throughout the you know i mean it, it, i'll give you an example when we, when we started angels envy the first fil- when we were going to do our first bottling mm. we we're having trouble with filtration particular and, filtration I guess. yeah right <clears throat> and before you knew it i had a guy from heaven i made one phone call a guy from heaven hill shows up this is a work day mm-hmm. um uh, a guy that used to be the plant manager at woodford shows up Somebody from Maker shows up. What the hell? You get a brain trust and they're shows all up? working on trying to, you know, it's like the phone tree, the the distiller <laughs> phone tree. <laughs> yeah. And they showed Batman up. Batman shows up. Right. Yeah. And then they they started working with us through, you know, this issue in about a half an hour. We, we figured it out. So, That's incredible. Yeah. And you see that all the time. You see that, especially at that level. The guys I work with that, you know, the master distillers, the brand founders, the you know the the the, the, the <clears throat> excuse me. You think of uh, you know Fred No. You think of uh, you know uh, Chris Morris. You think of like Bernie Lovers. Yeah. You think of all these guys that are really um, uh, Jimmy Russell, Eddie Russell, um, Chris Morris. You know this whole group is a pretty tight group of folks. It's so great, and we see each other everywhere. For the most part, we get along. Um, you know, and uh, and we help each other out whenever we can. It's not unusual for me to pick up the phone if I've got an issue, especially when we got the new distillery up. Right. You know, that was a monster project. You know, we're talking 90,000 square feet of, you know, of, uh, you know, 13,500 gallon fermenters. and Hell of a lot of questions, I bet. 
Yeah, and it's it's and, and they're not just questions that there aren't static answers to those questions because yeah. every every still is new, even though there's basic distillation principles, but right. every still has a personality. I know that sounds kind of weird. No, I get it. It totally yeah. does. Every um, guitar, I mean, six strings should do the same thing, right? For sure. But they but don't. They don't. Exactly. No. So, you know, there's a learning curve there, and you also learn from other people's experiences. And that was really at the time that I really started. I mean, I've always missed my dad, but from a business standpoint, where I, you know, where I really felt like we needed dad. Yeah. You know, I mean, the, up until then, you know, the blending, all the other things that we, we had done, you know, we had a pretty good handle on all that stuff. Sure. You know, we did from the very beginning. Dad was more of an overseer and an inspiration than an active day to day. Um, you know, he was always giving us inspiration. He was always, we were always going to dad for validation. Sure. Um, but as we got the distillery open, that's where he really would have shown even more. So, you know, so I get sad a little bit sometimes how did, about that. I think about that a lot actually too. You know, my dad's in the food industry and I think what if we could do something together, you know? Now, when I was younger, I wouldn't have ever thought about it. But now that there's a little more means, you get a little bit of <laughs> recognition in the industry had it when you guys finally were working kind of alongside each other to make this thing work how had that had that feel it was great it, it was it was great dad was always um it was never about dad yeah. it was always about creating something that was bigger than that you know mm-hmm. in his mind creating something working together as a family working to create you know dad i think that dad knew that that would probably be his last song thing. song yeah. And he didn't have to come out of retirement. He'd already done a walk off home run. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, he'd already done everything that, you know, in the industry. Right. Um, so he had no reason to come back. And I, I really believe that the reason he came back was to help create something for the next generation. That's amazing. And he did, you know, he, 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 uh, he helped us and he, uh, you know, without him and his inspiration and his, uh, you know, the, the love for dad around the world, you know, wouldn't have happened that way. Yeah. How long now, has Angels Envy been around as a brand? We've been on the market now since, uh, well, it's been almost six years, I guess. Wow. It's been six years now. And almost six years, yeah. I mean, that's a, it's a short amount of time to have yeah. developed such a big reach in the industry and the hearts and minds of, of whiskey lovers, you know, which, which again, yeah. is you know a testament to the staff and things. But did you think this was going to be what, how big it is? Did you see this being a hit? Did you see Bacardi getting interest or a larger company at some point? No. We we really, there, there's no way. Just like in the industry, nobody really could have predicted that the bourbon industry as a whole right. would be where it is now. And, you know, I mean, we knew we would, look, we knew we could create something that was good. You know, and that's really what I pressed Dad for when I, you know, when, when he agreed to do this project. We looked at, yeah. Uh, I told him I didn't want to do something just to do it. We wanted to look at unique things and things that he worked on over the years that maybe didn't see the light of day for whatever reason. Yeah. So he kept coming back to secondary barrel finishes because he did a lot of them with Glenn Morangi, oh, ground oh, foreman okay. on Glenn Morangi. Yeah. And we kept coming back. He's like, I've always wanted to do that. I've always wanted to release something finished in this or this. And we talk about Sherry. We talk about Port. Dad loves Madeira. You know, and, and we just kept coming back. And nobody had really, as an American whiskey Nobody's ever really been, been successful with a secondary barrel finish. Oh, yeah. So we weren't ready thought, for it until recently. Right. Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't the right time. Yeah. You know, Belvini has done it for years with their single malts, and they're, they're masters at that. So that's what we settled on as a way to make a difference. And right. once we realized we wanted to go in that direction, you know, then we put together a, a great design team, a great production team, a great sales team, you know, a good uh, finance team. We ran with it. What about, I, I like the, the creative process in art and obviously with projects because you're a very project-oriented guy, kind of next chapters, what's the next thing we can do? What is it about creating a brand that really appeals to you? Is it the aesthetic? Is it the story? Wow, that's a really good question. I think creating something that is lasting and is impactful, yeah. you know, that, that is disruptive, Oh, I like that. Yeah, um, that that's what excites me. Um, I just don't want to be the next in a line of things that are just the same. Right, and an innovator. I mean, that is your uh, title now, right? Yeah, I think so. 
I, I don't know what exact changes I think, from day I to think day. maybe innovation just means I don't want to become antiquated and I want to keep yeah. rocking the boat, you know? Yeah, you always have to rock the boat. You know, you always have to be asking the questions. You've always got to be looking at things from a different perspective. And yeah. I'm probably pretty good at that, maybe annoyingly so to <laughs> yeah. the people that work with me. Um, as some of them are here and they're kind of nodding their heads or saying, <laughs> I always love saying, this. This is one of my favorite things. We yes. Have PR people or, you know, publicists at the room and it's well, like, no, what should I, mean, I say? They, what? No, I say? no, they, they, look, I'm going to say whatever, but they know that I'm a pain in the ass to work with. But and, that's good. Yeah, All rock stars are pain. Well, in the that's ass, not, that's, that's really pushing it. No, oh, you, you no, think so? It, I think so. You, I, you're trial. Oh, I mean, lo, let me frame it this way. You travel around a lot, right? Which is good. You have family, you're a good family, man. I mean, this is, goes without saying. Even Mick Jagger had lots of kids, right? But, so you're getting to drink when you want, but mm-hmm. good stuff. You get to light up a room with your personality via, via performance. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you like the lifestyle? Do you like being the guy that people want to drink with, that people want to party with? I like, you know, you talk about collecting experiences. We talked about that earlier. Yeah. Um, I like the same with interactions. Sure. Um, being able to, you know, because you pick up little things from people along oh, the way. Absolutely, you pick up pieces of them and pieces of their experience in their lives, and you know, you carry those things with you. And I think they can make you a better person, or they can make you a worse person if you let it. However, you, yeah, yeah however, however you, you want to do it. So that's what I really like. I like those interactions um, probably more than anything. I don't like the travel. No, okay. I don't like the physical act of traveling. Right. I like like you know, I'll be exhausted sometimes, but when I get to the event, I usually perk up and. Doing the events I love doing. I don't like getting there. You're getting ready for the stage. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I'm not trying to say that this is an act, but you know how to work a room. I mean, you have to. You can't be this successful and not be a good people person. Well, I think that's what it's about. It's being a people person. And, you know, my feeling is is that I want to touch every person in that room. Before I leave, I don't, yeah. I don't mean touch as in touch their heart. <laughs> Impact, right? Right, right. Well, and I want to talk to every person in that room. Yeah. I mean, I, every single person at, a, at an event that I go to, I want to be able to speak with. It's during the course of that event. Was and your it, dad that also that kind of charismatic yeah, figure? Yeah, yeah, dad for sure. I, I don't think dad was as outgoing as I am, yeah. um, but dad had that ability in a more quiet way mm. to touch people, and um, he was always very impactful. You know, people always talked about after they met my dad, oh, what a great guy he is, and yeah. very humble, very unassuming, very, um, you know. Um, yeah, and you hear that consistently. I've never heard anything bad about my dad. Yeah. You know, that's a, I mean, a great example. Yeah, it is. He had a him. really dry wit and sense of humor, and we were very similar. I think in that respect, we'd sit and watch. You know, like our favorite show on television was Police Squad. You know, oh, like yeah, the Naked yeah, Gun yeah. stuff. Yeah. And, Leslie Nielsen and yeah. the uh, Zucker Brothers, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. and you know, so it was that kind of dry. You know, I don't. You know what time? When you mention those movies, you know what kind of humor. You totally. know, what we're talking but it's still about. funny. It's slapsticky. It's yeah. slapsticky, but there's deeper. There's always something else going on sure. that you have to look for. Does that make any sense? Social commentary. It's underlying. There yeah. is, and there's a lot of underlying stuff. There's a lot of stuff you miss unless you're really paying close attention. There's that. There's that immediate slapstick, that visual stuff. Yeah. But there's the things that are beyond that that you've really got to be in tune to catch, and those were the things that I always found interesting. It's easy to see kind of how you can light up a room and your interest in people, right? Um, but is there something that people aren't getting from you when you talk about police, police squad, right? Is there anything like underlying in you that people don't really notice about you? They really don't understand that you're this way. Wow. Um, I was reading an it's article. 75 an hour, by the way. This <laughs> I, was, I know. We're on the couch here. <laughs> I was reading an article the other day about introvert, extrovert personality. Uh-huh, yeah. And I think that's probably, I read that and I was like, man, that's you, you know, because I can only take so much. Really? And and Kelsey, who's with me now, I'll see that sometimes, uh-huh. that I, I sometimes have to step away to remove myself from the situation because I get a little overloaded. I see, okay. You know, I mean, it's not a stage fright thing, but it's a, okay, I've had enough of this now. Right. You need some me time? Let me come back here. Um, I'm not always good at the beginning of events at the, like the, the cocktail party chit chat stuff. Right. You know, I can't just be thrown into it. I've got to kind of ease my way into it. Oh, it's a yeah, weird, it's a weird. But but you know, once I'm up there, I'm fine. Yeah. So I don't know. That's that's a little quirky thing. Probably. No, I think then. that's really interesting. Yeah. I think it's a really insightful thing. And I hope people kind of get to understand you more because the thing is, 
there's all this brand centric stuff people doing you know let's talk about whiskey this and that like we can learn about whiskey but this this I'm, i've got this great opportunity to sit here with this guy who's done some really great shit mm-hmm. and you've proven to be successful time and time again i mean this bacardi thing's got to be it's got to feel pretty good you know i mean mm-hmm. it's at least some kind of validation but i the thing that's funny is i look at you and i say that is that yeah it's good for only so long until you need the next thing and i don't that, know if that's, that's a very good observation <laughs> So you can never rest on your laurels. No, I'm not good at that. It's the next shiny object kind of thing. I like sometimes. that though. I, I do. We have yeah. that in common. My wife worries about that. She's like, "Well, wh- when am I going to not be the next?" You know, I'm like well, it's not about that. But it's a it's a very um, especially you know it, it, success doesn't happen overnight and 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 comfort life comfort and you know for your family and and security yeah you know doesn't come overnight and. You know, it can be scary for a, if you have a partner that doesn't understand that and that isn't comfortable in knowing, okay, this is risky. We're going out on this net. Well, what's wire? Maybe without a net. Yeah, yeah. But there's enough trust there to know and your partner to know that, like, look, I'm not going to take her out there and let them fall. Yeah, yeah. I think and, it's and good. It's not, a, it's not easy. Not everybody has that. No. You know, from a partner standpoint. Yeah, right. It's hard to be around us. Sometimes. No doubt about it. You know? No doubt about it. I'm glad and, you've got, I call them handlers. I don't know if that's a <laughs> invective or not, but. Well, they're just, the, the folks I have, once again, that work with me are phenomenal people. And, um, you know, you know, I, I hear also, you know, Wes, 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 you did this, Henderson's did this, family did this. But, yeah. you know, this was a, we, we, it was our idea. Right. You know, we took the first steps, but there's no way on earth that the next steps couldn't have been taken without the team. Oh, it has to and you you're know, just one man well you know? it's just you know you it's impossible you know it's just impossible so um and i recognize that um you know i don't know if we always give enough credit but you know it's uh, it's very important i think so too well i have one last question for you. it's not a stumper but it's something i, I think we both love music i think we both love acting think about let's let's uh, imagine the savoy savoy the american bar in savoy and you're kind of sitting up there at the bar and you could have a drink with anybody living or past but normally i just leave it open but i want you to pick an actor that you would like to sit at the savoy and have a cocktail with an actor yeah wow because this is one we're going to make the sag thing happen i don't think i hope you don't think i'm joking with you we're going to do this so i want us to stay focused about acting think about that guy like i always think about like richard burton would be a guy i mean i wouldn't make it out alive probably if i was drinking with him but wow an actor or actress in all fairness yeah they're well that's a real tough one because you know, there's <laughs> lots of different genres of of uh of uh movies that i like yeah i'm trying to think of genres right now i could think if i'm thinking about comedy who would i want to sit with if i'm thinking about um okay there's two okay yeah please there's two people one of them's a writer and probably did some acting as okay. well okay. the other's a current actor perfect i'd say the writer actor would be Hunter S. Thompson. Oh, jeez. Could you? Would you make it out alive? That dude could drink anybody oh, into the table. I think man. you're tall, though. I'll give. I got I'd, some odds. I can. Yeah, that would be good. And the, I'd say Bill Murray. Oh, I would love to. Have you ever met yeah. Bill Murray? I've never met him. I came close. He was in um, in Barstown for the Bourbon uh, the Bourbon Festival in September. Yeah. And I had an opportunity to go down there. I didn't know he was going to be there. You know, it's like you know, really. That's what I want to do. I want to be Bill Murray. I just want to show up places. <laughs> you know, yeah. he just shows up at wedding receptions unannounced and hangs out in parties and, you know, and what a life, man. Oh, man, no kidding. You know, and, uh, you so know, I, he's in town. Ta- he's been in town. He's been everywhere. Well, it's true. He's everywhere all the time. Yeah. But he'll show up randomly. But I hear he has no cell phone. Mm. He doesn't have a manager. He doesn't have an agent. Just a dude. Good luck getting a hold of him. And right. maybe if you get a hold of him and he, you've got an idea that you'll move you wanted to be in, he'll, like, you know, he may call you back. Right. And what a way to live, though. I mean, just to be able to live without a damn cell phone or email. Yeah, or handlers. Wow. I mean, that's <laughs> – and, you know, Hunter S. Thompson, who's a Kentucky native, by the way. He's I didn't from know Louisville. That. I didn't yeah, he's that. from Louisville. And we've got something in Louisville called Gonzo Fest every year, which, which is – No kidding. It's I a no lot idea. of fun. Yeah. It's been only been going on for about four years. I want the distillery to host it this year. Oh, that'd be amazing. Yeah, so um, – but, yeah, but that's a great question. I, I appreciate that. That made me think really hard. I'm sorry. You know, I know these are supposed to be it's, easy. I know, man. It's 6 o'clock or 5 o'clock yeah. or whatever. And you've got your dinner coming up here at Pesce, which I do. Be amazing. Yeah, if you stick around in town next week and happen to be in San Antonio and we'll have to grab a drink, I'll be that around. That would be awesome. It's, it's really just been cool hanging out, Wes. Thank Thanks you. so much for Same me. Same here. I appreciate it. And uh, in this 
dungeony kind of industrial complex that I call a distillery. <laughs> you know, but like you said, you're just under the radar, though. That's right. You know, you're in a you're in a location where you know it's convenient, but nobody's going to bother you. They don't. Bother I like you. that. That's like my office in the new distillery. They put me in a corner. Yeah. I don't know whether that's to keep me away from <laughs> to keep me away you from know, them no comment. They're, from I'm not bothering gonna... <laughs> them, which is probably has something to do with it. Right. But and I've got my own stairs that kind of not my own stairs, but I got some stairs that go out the back and. You know, um, I, I, I work with my lights off like a vampire, so it's just oh, a I real, so I, there's a lot to be said for kind of being out of the way. I think so too. Brilliant, man. Thank you. Hopefully we'll catch up soon. Thanks, my pleasure. Guys. Thanks. Well, there we have it. The co-creator himself of Angels Envy Bourbon, Mr. Wes Henderson. It was great getting to sit down and chat with him about everything. You know, I've seen all these clips he's done for the media, whether it's CNBC, Fox News, and it's always about bourbon, but there's lots of to this man there's lots to his entrepreneurial spirit his motivation to always create and always keep doing new things so it was really a pleasure getting to sit down and chat with him and nerd out about music and film just a little bit so thank you for listening to should have e with mike g no matter if you're going to start drinking at 9 a.m this morning to watch the comey hearings or if you're thinking man i don't know how much more of this shit i can take please Keep dancing.